I didn't realize it at the time, but I was sort of taking in these beautiful homes that I was going into because we used to uh, catalog sellers for people that huge, huge sellers in their private homes. So we'd go to these homes and I didn't know I was going to be in construction at that time, but I was always fascinated by these homes and, and really took a sort of a, a deep dive into looking at them where some of my colleagues were just like, we're here to you know, look at the wine and they didn't really care what else was going on here. So welcome to episode 103 of the AFT Construction Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Levitt. And today we have Dagan Koffler with us. And Dagan is president of Dagan Design and Construction located in North County, San Diego. And Dagan was great to bring on. This is someone who's very adamant about construction. He's, he listens to a lot of the content that's out there. He's been building his business. He's doing some incredible pro- projects there in Southern California. But his background is a wine sommelier, right? He's worked in Manhattan. He's worked in design. He worked outside of this industry and how that made an impact and how that helped him structure his business now. And we looked a lot about, you know, not only company culture, but cost plus, lump sum, long lead times. How are we managing change orders with clients and duration timeframes? These are all key things that all of us should be applying to better our business, better the communication with the client. So without further ado, let's get started. So welcome to the AT Construction Podcast. And today we have with us Dagan Koffler. And Dagan is president of Dagan Design and Construction. So welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I'm sure you're dealing with a lot of things. We are digging as a fellow contractor and, uh, you know, supply chain has been really easy for most of us. <laughs> so it's yeah. just been, yeah, it's been extremely challenging. So how are you dealing with that right now in your market? Uh, like I said, it's pretty challenging. Um, we, we learned a lot this last year as far as what things are extremely backed up, what things basically you just can't get what things you need to order sometimes like as far as a year in advance. Um, so we had, we had a good little learning curve. Um, we were always pretty proactive on checking stock cause we, you know, especially in custom, you know, you never know. Sometimes there's a low stock of these custom materials. Um, so we, we always were pretty proactive on checking stock when we got those selections from designers. Um, but even more so now I, I actually tell clients up front we're going to take a big draw up front because like literally the second we break ground, I'm going to order your appliances because I know like Sub-Zero and Wolf are, they're like nine months out. So if it comes in in six months, we figure out a storing capacity for it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's the new norm. But we've been, we've been working pretty proactively on second we get those designer specs, we call the vendors. And if it's something that's low stock and there's enough, we just purchase it. Um, so how yeah. long, I mean, are you required to store most of this yourself? Are your distributors holding it? Are you buying direct? I mean, how does that work as far as what you're responsible for? Maybe the plumber with the plumbing fixtures or the distributor, you know, the showroom with the appliances. It's kind of vendor specific, but like, you know, we use Ferguson's in here in California for our, our appliances and um, they don't really store. But, you know, a couple occasions last year, we we worked at a situation where there was one fridge that we needed left in California. And my rep grabbed it for me and stored it for me for two months until this project, you know, got there. So, you know, like last year was just sort of like the Wild West and getting stuff. It was it was a little bit of a funny run. Um and we were in the midst of a couple of big projects and I was, you know, my, my current appliance vendor Ferguson couldn't get this, you know, exact washing dryer that fit for the specs we were doing. It was a, a lower a spec one. So I ended up having to buy it from a New York supplier. You know, it was just kind of crazy last year. Um, so, but, but normally, you know, it's, it's, vendor by vendor um but you know my plumbing supplier is super great they have it at an outside warehouse so they'll store everything they actually get it immediately because they know the same sort of difficulties of backlogs so they'll purchase it i'll pre-purchase it right when we, we get all the specs and they'll just hold it for me until we're ready um which is great too because we can get our rough valves in and then they just hold all the trim until we're ready yeah that's nice i mean we've had the same setup you know our distributor's been really good we we work with expressions here in phoenix for the most part studio 41 as well and they do a good job holding our, you know, especially plumbing fixtures. They'll they'll send us out the valves that we need to top out, and then you know hold the the trim until we're ready. But you know, appliances can be tricky because the lead time super long, parts yeah. are long, and then they're big when they they're come very in. Big, so, yeah, and yeah heavy. it's you not easy. Move them. <laughs> yeah, and and it's tough too because we're we're doing the same thing with light fixtures. One of the challenges we have is you go into my warehouse right now. We have a ton of light fixtures and a ton of plumbing fixtures. Even we're storing some. But the challenge is, I mean, of course, you have to uncrate it. You have to check it and make sure that it's not scratched or damaged. So yeah. you have to do the inventory control, but then you got to repackage it, save it, market, identify it, 
make sure it doesn't walk away, grow some legs. It's there, doesn't get damaged. And then six months later, put it out. And so that's something we hadn't really had to deal with, you know, in years past. And we're trying to figure out a system internally, you know, so what are you doing for your system wise, Dagan, as far as this is new, right? In the last year and a half, this product supply chain. So what are you doing to organize? I know you're ordering earlier, but how are you organizing what you have, you know, in stock? Um, we did kind of a similar system to what you did. We, uh, on this one job, we actually got a pod for the project just to store. And is uh, it on site or at your like site. home base? It was on site. Um, no issues with theft? No. I mean, most of the areas we work in are pretty um, you know, pretty high end, so there's not really a lot of theft problems. Um, both of these projects had neighbors close by, so it wasn't really something we were concerned about. Um, and that, that worked pretty well. Um, and, you know, we've two projects last year we used Le Conch ranges which come from France mm-hmm. um, and I think if you go by boat it's like about eight month lead time to get it um, so you know I think we stored it for about three months because they gave us a range of I can't remember five to nine months so we we went with the nine month and it came at like month seven so we were all right um, so stuff like that is just it's extremely hard but we end up storing and um, it, on new projects, which has been very interesting, I actually scope out if it's a remodel, is that garage available? Is it lockable? Can we use it? Because we are going to start purchasing tile. Um, if the designer calls out a specific tile and there's 100 square feet and we need 80, we're going to we're gonna buy it like tomorrow. Um, so we've, we've been really proactive on that. Um, and it also is helpful when we get those specs to do that. So if it's like, you know, the, the vendor says this thing's been out of stock for six months and we have no idea when it's coming back, like we can get back to the designer and they, they can, you know, give us a, an alternative pretty quickly. Um, so that's been, you know, it's also been super helpful for the designer because we, we get them information back like this tile is just not going to be available. So we need something else soon. Um, so, yeah. how, so how often, let me ask you this, with your projects, how often before you start the project do you have all the selections made? If I have a, a designer on board, um, usually about when we're starting. So, you know, I'm doing a house in Rancho Santa Fe right now, as you know well. Um, oh, yeah. And I just Great place. This, I love Rancho Santa Fe. It's, pretty, it's a pretty place, yeah. Um, I just had a um, meeting with the designer on Monday, and um, she's having her meeting with the owners next week. And basically, we're, we're shooting to break ground sometime in October, and, you know, we're hoping to get that spreadsheet of, of – stuff in the next three weeks so we'll have it you know roughly about a month before we break ground um you know we don't do a massive amount of new builds just because our area is pretty built out here so a lot of our core is is you know large house remodels additions you know addition of a guest house whatnot um so but that's sort of the the standard schedules we'll get it hopefully within a few weeks of breaking ground and basically we start we start moving as far as ordering and being proactive on on getting you know, stock of things and how long the lead times are and things like that. It's good to do that. You know, it's funny. I've I've received, I shouldn't say pushback, but a lot of people are like, Brad, it's kind of unrealistic that you've taken the stance. You have to have all selections made before you start. Right. And, you know, it's easy to say, well, every project where I've moved forward without having all the specs, like it's been (laughs) a disaster. Like it's really been painful, like either to our bottom line or our relationship with the client or construction schedule. And almost the case of all the above, right? And, and what I've found is that even more so now with COVID, as, as building schedules are longer, durations are longer, labor is more restrictive, everyone's building, everyone's refinancing, money's cheap, so you see a lot of this demand. But I found that it's even more important now that if you can have the selections, well, now at least you have an idea of the finishes and products in the house, and you can either order early, as you mentioned, you're ordering appliances nine months in advance, which is unheard of. you know. And so by having the specs, now you can order and actually be ready when it's time to schedule to install a certain product. Yeah. I mean, it's basically just trying to stay ahead of the curve a little bit and, and like, it's, it's just kind of a new, a new way of doing it. And, you know, two years ago, I, I would have never really thought I, you know, I know that tile. I'm pretty familiar with it. It's usually in stock. I can usually get it within two to three weeks. No big deal. But now, you know, if I call my vendor, they'll be like, we haven't had that in six months. And our vendor's telling us they're not doing a new run for another six. It's like, that could be a year long if you really want that tile, um, which in years past, like that was just, just never heard of. Um, so, so it what, is, it's yeah, a new norm. Yeah, it is. And so what are some of the products, you know, without calling out 
a ton of vendors, but I mean, what are some of the products you're dealing with in your market that you're having to spend a lot of time just saying, this is X, Y, and Z that we need to order now, or at least get on our radar? Um, well, like the big ones, appliances, you know, we, we more or less almost always use Sub-Zero or Wolf and Cove in pretty much every house. Sometimes we use Le Conch range or, um, one of the French ranges, but, um, I mean, I ran into this very specifically on a project recently where, um, the range, because Wolf, uh, came out with a new line, they basically didn't have a range available for six months. So I moved a family in. <laughs> Thankfully, they were super, super nice and understanding. <laughs> but we were we were four months late on their range, and I ordered it the day we signed the contract. I ordered all the appliances the day we signed the contract. So the range was basically six months late on a on a nine month uh, remodel. So <laughs> there's not much I can do. <laughs> yeah, you just explain so what's going on and. Um, you know, they made the best of it. We we built them a really cool outdoor barbecue area. And, um, you know, we live in San Diego, so you can kind of be outside most of the year. And yeah. they made the best of it. They barbecued outside for about two and a half months. So it was cool. It worked Get out. Get a Traeger <laughs> and smoke it outside all day. Yeah, they, they were good. They were good. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you you bring that up, Dagan. And what's interesting is, you know, I look back now, we're starting a remodel. And we do a few remodels. You know, most of our stuff is new build, commercial, residential. But, um, you know, these are more invasive remodels or big remodels. And so, but the advantage is having known, similar to you, I mean, we have a database we're tracking, right? So we're, we're actually tracking in our documentation. Okay, well, what are the lead times that are getting us on every project? And it's kind of that audit, right? So as a team, mm-hmm. we're having that group audit in our team meeting saying, okay, what are you having delays on? And so now we know, okay, is roof tile an issue? Are appliances an issue? Tile, countertops, I mean, some slabs, you know, we can't get. And so we're, we're documenting this, you know, plumbing fixtures. And so we know these, these hot buttons, if you will. And then what we're doing, so like this remodel that we're starting, we have our designer, we have our architect, and they've been awesome. We have our full design book. So we went to the client and we said, okay, we need our deposit, which is, you know, standard deposit to get started and contract everybody. But we're also going to order plumbing fixtures. We're going to order appliances, countertops. We're actually going to release the cabinet vendor to start moving forward on the cabinet drawings because the remodel is a little bit easier to do that. I mean, we're going to field measure, of course, but it gets the paperwork going, it gets the signatures done, it gets the product, and then we'll just field measure, right? And so what's happening is the deposit's bigger for the client, but the surety is, hey, we're going to price lock these things. We're going to have to store them for eight or nine months, but that's something we never had to do. It's a little bit more time and you know organization from our side, but it's definitely expediting the schedule. Yeah. And I think, just, again, like, you know, you talk a lot about communication and, and we front load some of our progress payments are a little bit, you know, I, I usually do lump sum and I, I know you guys are more. I was going to ask about that. Cost plus. Um, well, we'll so, dive into you know, that in just a second, but yeah, go ahead. Totally. Dave, and yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's so I, I just front load a couple of my payments, you know, with the knowledge that the reason is, is because I'm trying to expedite and accelerate this project without, you know, coming into these huge delays and. I mean, it's crazy. I remember uh, all years prior, I could get a sub zero in about two weeks. Um, and it's just, it's not the new norm. <laughs> so, you know, we're just, we're just moving along and making changes as it goes. So th- this has always intrigued me. I know, you, you know, we've done both. I, most of my career was lump sum. I, as you mentioned, predominantly we've moved to cost plus. Um, for a lot of reasons, not just COVID related, but you know, just with the projects we're working on now and our clients and their involvement and stuff. It, it, it seems to be a much easier process. Um, and thankful, you know, I'll give a little shout out here. I mean, I'm part of this Builder 20 group and they've been great just as far as, you know, counsel me and help me out with some structure things. But I'll say going back to my question here is how do you do a lump sum with the remodel? Because I know you're doing a lot and these are high-end remodels and there's just, there's a lot of unknowns. So how do you protect yourself? Say, okay, client, the house remodel is going to be X, but you know, as we open this up, there may be some changes. I mean, how are you handling that with a lump sum? I mean, I, I, you know, I've listened to a handful of your podcasts and uh, communication is a a big thing. Um, I do try to put in a lot of notes within my proposals that, you know, after demolition, you know, like flooring is a good example, like no floor and any remodel is flat. So I have no (laughs) idea how much prep work is going to be, but there's going to be a lot of prep work. We're going to have to self-level to get it flat. So that's always like a very easy one. Like, but but how do you do that when you're bidding? If let's for easy math, if you say okay, your yep. floor is going to be fifty grand, are you 
adding like a fluff line on there and being transparent with them? Or I mean, how are you adding contingency? Because they may have like, if it's over a basement, they may have like lightweight concrete gypcrete. And as yep. you're pulling up old tile or wood, it'll pull that up and you have to re-pour, right? There's so many variations. So how are you doing that just so the client's aware of what their costs? I basically potentially... let them know within the proposal that there's going to be an additional cost, but we don't know what that cost is until we can get the demo done and see how bad the floor is. So you're so, going to itemize that like specific scope areas? Yep. Yeah. So in my, in, in my flooring, I'm going to say, I, you know, there's, there's a, we have an allowance, basically a couple dollars for basic prep. You know, that's to grind whatever basic surface was there. But, but once demo is complete, we're going to reevaluate, look at the flooring, and I'm going to present you with what our prep to get this floor flat is going to be. So it's basically, it's like, it's like a, a preempted change order, so to speak. So I'm telling them we're going to have an additional change order for this, but I don't know what that dollar amount is until I can see the, the you know, the, the raw floor. It's because I can give them a number, but it, I'm just guessing, you know, based on the square footage, you know, you, you know, previous historical costs that we've done i can sort of give them a ballpark and sometimes i even do i said the range is usually between 10 and fifteen thousand of lightweight concrete and prep work to get this floor flat right or you have self level or whatever it may be if the concrete slab's super bad yep. or you know so my other question to that it, it, and going back to the conversation we've been having is you know this is all new right the new norm here and for example, escalation clause. I mean, this is something I've heard of in the industry. You know, it's not something we ever used or had, yep. especially on lump sum where we've never dealt with lumber going up 340%, right? We've never dealt with some of these skyrocketing numbers. So do you have escalation clauses or how do you outline certain products? You know, lumber is a good example of something you're bidding. And then when it comes kind of come, becomes time to purchase, that price is going to be a little bit different than what you had quoted. And actually, uh, it's, uh, it's actually almost the exact wording I use now is this estimate is good for 14 days, but until the day of purchase of lumber, we'll reevaluate what that number is. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm trying to leave it open-ended. I'm giving them what it was when you get this proposal. It's good for 14 days. And then I will tell you what it's going to be the day that we're ready actually to purchase. So basically, I've kind of just kept it open and like, you know, it, it could be a couple thousand more next month. It could come down. Uh, we, you know, lumber is a little radical right now. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's been going up and down and it's depending on what, you know, lumber species you're buying. So, so when you're going to the client, you're saying, okay, it's going to be $100,000 for a remodel. You know, you have 14 days to sign. They sign within that 14 days. Are you highlighting? Are you itemizing these scope numbers saying, okay, even though we're at a hundred grand, Keep in mind, lumber or a few others may escalate. And I can't, even though you're locking this price in with me today, I may be 90 days before I order lumber. And, you know, I can only lock my lumber within seven days of order. Right. You know, so, so how are you communicating that? Pretty much just like that. Um, that, you know, this is, I, I went to the lumber, you know, my, my framer got our lumber list and here's our current package. This is what it costs today. Um, but, and I say basically, unless we purchase in the 14 days, it's going to be whatever that lumber list is in the day of purchase plus our markup, whatever it is. So I, I've been communicating. We just did one where it kind of worked out. Basically in my contract, I said, here's the price today, but we probably won't be purchasing till October 15th. And I will re-bid that in October 15th and tell you, and then that's going to be the price for lumber. <laughs> yeah. And, are and you it's not up, much I can do. <laughs> it's tough. And, and what's, what I find too is, you know, I customers will want consistent updates too. I mean, especially with the lumber, you know, I look back at a house that we just had going to frame stage. And of course, you know, we had eight months of site work before we could start, you know, or lumber, right? It's just, it's, it's built into a hillside. There's a lot of work there. And the client, you know, we had updated them, I think three times in those eight months, but keep in mind, lumber was changing every two weeks for a while there. And, you know, that's something where we made the mistake. You know, I, I probably should have updated them weekly, at least twice a month, maybe just so they knew as this is escalating, because they made the comment, Hey, Brad, Maybe we could have went to ICF, which you know I explained to him from a builder side. It's a lot more complicated to go to ICF. I mean, this yeah. is engineered, it's structural. I mean, this is this it's is a big easy. change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy. However, you know, had they have known that this is moving, and and you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But you know, how are you updating it? Are your suppliers really good with you? You know, because one thing I found is that some of my suppliers are really good. Like, hey, Brad, this is tracking; it's moving. We're out of stock. You know, so they're really good about that. Some are just they leave us in the dark and it's up to us to be a good steward and, and be following up consistently. 
A lot of the updates actually are, are coming from my subcontractors, um, mainly because they're trying to stay ahead of the price increases. So, you know, I, I know my drywaller called me last week and was like, you know, just so you know, 10% moving forward in all material costs because um, we just saw a 10% increase. And my framer, um, he called me very specifically to tell me, you know, bids are only good for seven days now. So unless we purchase, that's only good for seven days. Um, so a lot of it's coming from the subcontractors um, and them letting me know what their price increase is going to be based on sort of the market conditions. Um, so it, it's been good to have that communication with them. And I know they're just trying to cover their their own companies and, you know, these increasing costs. And they don't want to have these conversations with me down the road. Like, you know, I told you it was going to be 26,000, but, you know, we had a 15% increase in our material. I'm like, I don't want to eat that. You don't want to eat that. So we want to try to stay ahead of the curve. So we're, you know, being transparent with the client that these things are just moving parts. And we'd like to keep you up to date. So we don't overcharge you, but we don't have to take hits on the other end as well. Yeah, it's smart. You know, it's funny you look back and there's so much education we're having quickly now on how to contract and communicate with our customer. You know, I look back to when COVID started, we had a home, we contracted the framer, lump sum project. You know, we had a hard number for lumber, for material, trusses, everything. I contract them, pay them a deposit. Well, this was in February and then it was time to order lumber in July, right? <laughs> so now they're hitting me with like, a big change order. And I'm like, Hey guys, this is exactly why I contracted you. Right. And it was a little painful for both of us because in years past that would have been acceptable, but you know, although there was no escalation clause with us and the client, well, now I got to figure this out. Cause I have a frame that's ready to walk. You know, if I hire another framer, it's going to be more money because I'm going to be paying that additional markup and he's giving me a discount just because he was in. And so, you know, it's painful for me. You know, I, I, you know, it'd be easy to now I'd be a lot more prepared, right? Because I understand it's cost plus or it's escal escalation clauses. So anyone yeah. listening, I think it's really valuable to understand, you know, that you're itemizing or communicating this with a customer on your contract and with your suppliers and your vendors so that you're protected, whether you're lump sum, like you dig into cost plus, it doesn't matter. There's some protections in there. Yeah. And, and it's really challenging with remodels and, re you know, additions, because there is so many unknowns. Um, I think, you know, I think I've, uh, I can't remember who said it, but, you know, cost plus is the risk is on the homeowner to spend as much as they want. Lump sum, the risk is a little bit more on the contractor. So I think on a remodel, homeowners could just get sort of out of control and the, the numbers can just skyrocket because we're just going to keep using the best guys to make this perfect. But without really sort of defining what that is and keeping the homeowner in check. I think lump sums worked a little bit better for me as far as renovations go. Um, I take a little bit more of the risk, but I think I'm also, I'm confining the project. So it just doesn't like, well, we opened that up. Let's just keep going. And, you know, with the cost plus, I could just see that sort of getting out of control. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I think it's tough both ways. Cause when you start looking at a management side, right, that, that meter's ticking when we start. So if, if we're delaying the project and we're, you know, not on top of our schedule, we're dealing with labor issues. You know, there has to be some ownership from our side. You know, at the same time, if the client's making a ton of changes, they're indecisive, they're not making payments on time, whatever it may be, and they're dragging this out, there has to be some protection for you, Dagan. So on a cost plus, you know, a lot of cases, a lot of builders are charging a monthly fee, right? For their mm -hmm. supervision. And then they do the cost plus lump sum, you know, it's set up. There's probably 5,000 ways to set that up, you know, from an administrative sure. side. So how are you managing the client process when they go to you, Dagan, and they're delaying it or they're making a ton of changes, doing a bunch of ads? Is that a conversation? You know, do you mark it up? I mean, how are you communicating that just for the duration that may impact your bottom line, just how long your, your staff will be out there? Yeah, it's communication and, and you know, huge learning curve because, you know, five years ago, I was just, you know, oh, yeah, I, I, I want to get these change orders done for you because you've asked me and I want I want to get it done. <laughs> um, but, you know, you know, my dumb brain was like, well, it's going to be three more months. I got a porta potty, I got a fence, you know, I got, you know, all these costs that I'm covering. Um, and now basically it's it's a change order on your sort of general requirements of the, of the project. Um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've for sure taken many hits on accomplishing change orders that I didn't really need to do, but was trying to appease the client and, and I really didn't mark up the full change order correctly. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard. It's funny you say that, but this is this is valuable. This is one thing I learned early in my career was the, the duration change order. 
Yeah. And it's very common in commercial construction, especially in residential. We don't use enough. And and there's a few ways to handle that, right? You may be doing a goodwill, digging for your client and say, okay, you're going to do this change. It's going to add three days. You know, I'm going to charge you $0, but it's going to add four days of duration. And you have them sign. It's a $0 change order, but to duration. Or they may say, okay, you know, you're building this ICF house, which has happened to me. We're <laughs> past inspection. We're ready to pour all the walls. And the client says, I want to change my window package, right? And yeah. you're like, we're pouring tomorrow. We got to call the concrete trucks off. We got to change window openings, talk to supplier. We have windows already here. You know, this is a major deal. And you have to properly say, okay, this is a three-month delay, right? And and put that in writing. And so then that way, here's the cost of, you know, the window change, but also here's 90-day delay and here's the cost for that. And then the advantage of that, even if you don't charge them for the duration, which you should, but even if you don't, at least at the end of the project, when they say, Brad, you're super late. Why does it take so long to build my house? You can say, well, hold on. Remember all these changes you made, A, B, and C that added, you know, two and a half months? This is why. Yeah. And I was, I, you know, in the past, I've just never, I was not good at documenting that to portray it. Cause like you said, the homeowner changed 30 things and they, they think that the schedule stays the same. Yeah. So when that day comes, they're like, well, why aren't we done? I was like, well, let me, let me walk you back a little bit of the things that we accomplished in that time frame, um, things that were not on the original scope of work. So it's, it's a learning curve and I, I've gotten better at it. Um, setting up systems, like, you know, I've, I've heard you say, you know, setting up systems is just key. So getting those change orders right away, getting them signed, making sure that everyone's on the same page and telling them, you know, if we want to do this, you know, we're, it's easily a month. This is a month to redo what you want to do or whatever the time frame is. But, um, but letting them know, so at least there's that upfront expectation, like you want to do this, we are happy to do it, but here's the, you know, the trickle effect of that. Um, so it's just communication. <laughs> yeah, it does come down to communication. So every change order, every contractor should at least internally be thinking, even a designer, right? If they're doing additional furniture, or whatever, they should always have a price and a time in that change order. So at least they're communicating that. Now, going back to your schedule side, this is going to dictate our success on the project. So how involved are you with the client to give them the schedule or, and how accurate have your schedules been just in our current market with, even though you have a ton of database, ton of history here, Dagan, like how has that changed, you know, in the current market? Um, you know, one of the longest delays we've had actually is permitting. And I don't know if you guys oh are my gosh. that. It's um, so bad. It's really bad. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and real quick, if I interrupt you, it's really yeah, frustrating. No. <laughs> and and I, what I, what, what's really irritating to me is what our municipalities and our government officials don't understand is that by them dragging their feet or coming up with new things that aren't in the code or in for here, we're dealing with like 100 year flood zones and stuff, and civil's been a huge issue for us. But they, don't, they, they can kill a project. I mean, by them delaying six months, these clients get worn out and they're like, we're done. Brad, I know you've been working with us for a year, but we're done. We're emotionally detached. We're going to yep. go a different direction to move. And, and so they kill projects that hurt us, you know, hurt the tax, you know, potential for the city. I mean, there's a lot of. Oh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's brutal. Um, yeah. It, permitting is one of the l longest things. I mean, I just had to write an email the other day for a client I'm doing in, um, I don't know if you know Fairbanks Ranch, the community. Oh there. yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have a you know they have a private HOA, so we have to go through a design review board before we can even submit to um, the county. Um, and you know they only wait once a month, so you know it could be a three month process just to get their approval before we can even go into construction docs. Um, but you know the time frame I'm giving them for an addition remodel is you know five five to nine months in permitting for a basic addition remodel. Which in years past, you know, we could probably get that three, three to six months, no problem. Um, I, you know, uh, I was going to mention it later, but I, I, I have a bit of a pet project. It's a house I'm building, a spec house. Um, that's either going to be for my family or for to sell. We'll see. But I'm going through it in one of the coastal cities and uh, they have a new portal system. I don't know if that's what everyone's yeah. using. In yeah, because COVID, it's all portal online. It's all portal. So I have a list of, you know, I had to do a grading plan. I have a list of 12 uh, departments and all of them were supposed to respond by August 9th and three have responded out of the 12 and <laughs> there's no recourse. There's nothing. I'm just waiting around. <laughs> yeah, so it's so tough. And it's um, not like you go to a city and talk to them because they're not there, go there or they're not answering. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I tell everyone this story. I, uh, the planning department's been horrible. Uh, the, the first round of plan check, the guy was three weeks late on his own due date, and I emailed him 14 times and got zero responses. 
It's amazing. There's no accountability. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough. Can you imagine if we didn't respond to our clients? You know, we wouldn't be in business very long. No, I I try to tell. I even I emailed the city manager uh, just to give them some insight on what's happening to our building departments. <laughs> and and how transparent challenging. are you? Yeah, but what, so once you get the permit, you know, and you're you you break ground and you're starting the remodel or new build, you know, how involved are you giving that information to the client or look aheads? You know, how transparent are you with the schedule? Pretty transparent. Um, um, we use co-construct, which is uh, similar to builder mm -hmm. trend. Um, but we build our schedules out. Um, and we share those schedules and we try to be pretty, you know, on, on remodels, there's a lot of fluff, you know, here and there, as far as, you know, we, we may be accomplishing X over here because, you know, that portion was done. It's a little bit different than new builds, as you know, you know, it's not, we can't schedule as systematically just because things get demoed, tiles available there. We can start on bathroom three, whatever the scenario is. So, um, you know, our schedules are a little bit fluid in that sense, but we try to stay on those marks. And again, just, it's just talking with them as we're going through this is, you know, if you want to upgrade this or here's the challenges we're looking at. Um, but you know, on remodels, we're pretty good about keeping, keeping those schedules fluid. Now, we're super excited to welcome one of our new sponsors to the podcast, Pella Windows. And this is even more exciting because we use Pella in so many of our projects, nearly all of them. And they've been just an incredible partner of ours. And locally, Sammy and Adam, they are not only amazing business partners behind us, but they are super close friends. And I speak on the podcast all the time about the importance of relationships, right? Relationships with our customers, with our vendors, with our suppliers, because at the end of the day, I'm only as good as those that help our brand and assist us in our projects to, to take it from the ground up all the way to completion. And if we didn't have partners such as Pella, there's no way we'd be who we are today. Over the years, we've built this amazing relationship. When we call them or email them, they respond. They're quick. Their their company culture, their integrity, their honesty. You know, they are always there to do what's right for us and the customer. They can do anything from small replacement projects to large custom homes and even multi-million dollar commercial projects. And also, when you think about their product line, they can do ultra contemporary, historical preservation, and large traditional projects. So for anyone, any scale, any size, they're the ones to call. They're here local. You know, they have an amazing Instagram. Make sure and give them a follow to see what they're doing. So if you need windows and doors, give Sammy and Adam a call. We stand behind Pella. We love what they do, their culture, their brand, and especially their quality. And if you want to learn more about Pella Windows, check our show notes. We'll have everything tagged there so you can give them a follow and have their contact information to reach out. And now let's get back into the episode. So now, did you grow up there in San Diego? I know you're building there in North County. I mean, and, and what's your footprint? I did. I grew up in Solana Beach. Um, so oh, nice. Been been here a long time. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I mainly I haven't. Um, so uh, oddly, yes and no. My my uh, we moved to Solana Beach in mid '80s, and my dad actually was a for a handful of years he was a production framer in Los Angeles. Um, so he was you know doing hand nails on you know two three story apartment buildings back in the '70s and. Um, so we actually built our house when I was a kid. So I grew up sort of in a construction site and, you know, it was, I, I always tell the story. I was up on a two story roof doing my, my own, uh, asphalt shingle. Like when I was like eight years old or something <laughs> with, with no harness. No. Right. <laughs> so, um, so OSHA I, friendly. I, I, ocean friendly, right. O OSHA, uh, so OSHA I, friendly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I grew up in the, you know, with a knowledge of construction, it's always sort of been in my DNA a little bit. Um, but I went to school in, um, Sonoma and, uh, actually on a soccer scholarship and, um, played soccer there. And I actually work in the wine industry prior to getting in construction. So I, um, right out of college, I, I actually worked heavy in the wine industry for, uh, close to eight years, I think something like that, six to eight years. Um, so it was, it was an interesting, uh, career prior to uh to being a general contractor <laughs> so what what brought you back out of curiosity out of the wine industry um so my wine industry career was i worked at uh, tasting rooms in sonoma and napa when i was in college um and then um after college i actually got a job in new york and i worked for a big wine auction and i used to it was kind of neat actually i, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was sort of taking in these beautiful homes that I was going into because we used to uh, catalog sellers for, right. you know, people that had huge, huge sellers in the private homes. So we'd go to these homes and, uh, you know, I'd always 
I didn't know I was going to be in construction at that time, but I was always fascinated by these homes and, and really took a sort of a, a deep dive into looking at them where, you know, some of my colleagues were just like, we're here to, you know, look at the wine and they didn't really care mm -hmm. what else was going on here. Um, so that was, I went to the, uh, I was in wine auctions and then I um, ended up working on the service side, which is restaurants. And I was a sommelier for, um, now a disgrace, but uh, Mario Batali, who was a big restaurant owner, <laughs> I yeah. worked for his sort of empire. <laughs> um, and I was a sommelier for a couple of his big restaurants. Um, and mainly the thing that sort of drove me out of that industry was the hours. Um, it's pretty brutal. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of like nights, noon, weekends, and mm -hmm. it's noon to 2 a.m. <laughs> pretty yeah. daily. Right. Um, so I burned out on that pretty quick. I loved the wine industry, and I'm still, you know, I still buy wine a lot and we love it. My wife and I, you know, we like to drink good wine. So it's, it's a, it's a really cool industry. Um, I just got burned out on sort of what it was. And I, I sort of saw the, the ceiling as well, as far as what you can do in the wine industry. Um, I didn't want to be a distributor and I, I wasn't really in, involved on what, you know, you can really make money in the wine industry. Um, so it just sort of, it, it ran its course and it was great. <laughs> And did you immediately go on your own? I mean, what, how, how did you get the experience, you know, especially to work on some of these high-end homes there in Southern California? So a, a little bit um, when I was in New York, I also was, um, I was part of a sort of a design group that did um, photography. So I used to actually build sets. Um, so oddly, I used to build kitchens in the middle of New York in these like Soho lofts for like companies like Kraft Food. Um, so it, it, I was always sort of building at the same time because I had a little bit of knowledge and just from growing up in it, I, I knew how to use tools and, um, you know, I built furniture and stuff as a kid and I was just a little bit handy. Um, so uh, I had that in my DNA, like I said, and so that was a, it, it was actually a really interesting experience because um, I ended up doing, um, I don't know if you've heard of DIFA, it's a um, it's Design Institute for Fashion Fighting AIDS. It's a huge uh, event that's held in New York and you get sponsored by like we were sponsored by the New York Times design section to build this uh, dining table. It has to seat 10 people and it's supposed to be like elaborate and just as crazy as you can make it. So uh, I did make a table and we did this whole design for it. Um, so it was a fun experience, a lot more design and furniture based than building, but it, it just got that wheel spinning on, you know, what else can I do? And that's sort of what led me into, to, you know, saying I need to go get my general contractor's license and start doing this. And what pulled you back to San Diego? Just kind of New York's a really hard place to live. I love it, but it's a hard place to live. You know, you're always poor. You just can't, you yeah, can't get ahead. Expensive. Um, and I love New York. It's still a, a, you know, I have friends there and we try to visit it when we can, but it's just, it's a hard place to live. And I think it was just sort of like, again, it ran its course and we're, my wife's also from Southern California. So we kind of just said it was time and we, we made a road trip and, and made our way back. <laughs> so it's interesting, you know, I, if my background, which you may know a little bit, I grew up in La Mesa, well, Lemon Grove and went to high school Helix, which is just South of you. And, you know, my uncle's own electrical company. So we were working in Coronado and La Jolla and Rancho Santa Fe and doing same thing. You know, here I am, this teenager and, you know, very, grew up a very blue collar and, um, in Lemon Grove, which <laughs> if you know the East, East County, they'll yeah, dig in a little for bit, sure. you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not Solana beach. No, not no. saying, you know, but, um, but yeah, it was just, it was interesting to, to see these amazing homes and it just, you know, my passion started and I'm like, you know, this is something I definitely want to do. And, and it's funny, you look back and we've been talking about this, you know, hindsight's 2020 20. had, I'd known last year how to better prepare my business for COVID and processes and, how we do our billing would have really helped us bridge some things and communicate with our customers. But as you look back, I mean, what's the biggest lesson you learned? You know, here you are, wine, wine sommelier, and you're coming into construction. I mean, that's a complete career change. You know, what do you wish you had known or had structured your company a little bit different from day one? Gosh, there's a ton of things. Um, you know, I think I think most general contractors are are a little bit scared to grow um, quickly. Um, but I, 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 I kind of went in just full steam ahead. You know, if I, and I think you've spoken about a lot of it's just sort of luck. You know, I, I, I got this one gig that, you know, was a great remodel and you put everything into it. I didn't really know how to set up a contract. You know, I was just sort of getting my, my list of vendors and subcontractors. And, you know, you go through some, some subcontractors and vendors and some work better than others and some, you know, get what you're doing and some don't. And so you just, it's a work in progress in that sense. Um, but 
I, I kind of just give it to a little luck. I got this couple projects. They were in, you know, high visibility areas and it just sort of spirals. And, you know, once you get a couple of these big ones and you start working with a couple, you know, big name designers or people that are well known in the area, then it's just sort of, you get those connections and all of a sudden, you know, that real estate agent knew that you did a house down the road and he's got a client looking at this house and, you know, that's probably the guy for you. You should call him. Same thing with, with designers. They, you sort of get what you do and you know if you're a good fit then every time they get a new project you're you're on their list so it's kind of just sort of the spiral effect of how i got to where i am and i was super lucky i, I got to work with some some really big name designers and um a couple of how did that architects. happen i mean did, was there a relationship there or, or you know how did you know um design? um so i i worked with studio mcgee uh it's, it's been about a year since we finished that project but it's also eric olson who um is out of newport uh -huh. beach who's just insanely talented um no the client i i got in when they were in escrow um and sort of i was able to help navigate um the building permit you know we're in the coastal zones and just permitting is very chaotic really difficult here. yeah super difficult um there's just not a lot of people that understand it and know it and you know when you're in escrow i i get calls so often you know from a group of real estate agents that i work with that you know i got a client looking at this and we have no idea what we can and can't do <laughs> yeah. we can't find anyone the title company they don't know anything you know no one knows anything can you enlighten us on you know can we build out you know can we do an adu what are our pool restrictions whatever the, it is um so i i've I've just been doing this long enough and, and um, working with cities long enough to I've sort of developed a pretty good knowledge base on um, the coastal codes. Um, so basically the, the, the project with, with Student McGee and Eric Olson was I, I got in with, I was actually the first sort of to be contracted. Um, and then they asked me for a handful of recommendations. I, I did some local people and they on their own just sort of branched out and said, what do you think of these people? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> well, they're You're like, yeah, you know, home run. Amazing. I mean, sure. If they're, you know, if, if that's, if that's the aesthetic and, you know, give them a an email and see if they're willing to take on this project. And, um, we met with Studio McGee and, and, you know, the owners loved their stuff. It was just sort of the aesthetic they wanted. And then, um, same thing with Eric. They sent me Eric and they're like, we we keep getting back to Eric's designs. You know, what do you think? And I was like, he's an extremely talented dude. If he wants to come down and you guys are game for it, then great. And Eric came down, we met and he was game for it. And, uh, that's sort of how the team got together. Um, so it was a very, very natural, organic sort of development of that team. It's amazing because, you know, a lot of us still the term around luck, but I've seen a lot of people that, you know, use the term lucky, but, I, you know, hard work, dedication, communication, you know, it, it puts you in positions to be successful, right? And some to call it luck, but, you know, someone who's always striving for that, you know, they're going to make their own luck essentially. And you look at that, I mean, we're fortunate too. We're going to be doing all with Shay um, and, and here in town with Studio McGee and just that relationship. It's amazing how the community, you know, designer, architect, and for you, Dagan, as you meet these architects and designers outside of your network, although they're from other parts of the country, I mean, there's still a huge benefit to you and you look at their platform and I, I'm sure you can attest that's the value of social media, right? And these relationships that if you have a social media, if you're already marketing and now you get a studio McGee or now you get Eric Olson, well, now it takes you to the next level because people actually follow them. They have a following, right? People, and, and so it brings people over to your account. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, uh, I was a little bit new to the Instagram game and um, hadn't really been grasping it quite and, and not being as involved that I should have been. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Watching Shay, er Eric is just, he's kind of funny. Cause yeah, I don't think he actually does a lot on Instagram, but he's just so followed. <laughs> yeah. Anytime he just puts a, a nibble out there, people just grab it. Um, and, but Shay is, you know, she's, you know, very masterful in, in her way of using Instagram and, and that platform that she's created around it. Um, and even it, it was really fun watching, the development of of how she even operates on site you know she did i can't remember three or four site visits um and she you know she's at night she's always you know updating what are we doing this is the project these are the cool things that happen it's just it's amazing and and people definitely gravitate towards that those updates and just sort of seeing what she's doing on a daily basis and obviously the homes are awesome and, and the work is is amazing so that it's all it's a it's a pretty complete package <laughs> yeah it's amazing that's that's what's neat i mean and you talk about branding marketing right and 
you know, not to speak just for Shea, but I know other designers and architects. I mean, what's you, you get to a point where you've leveraged social media and your marketing and, and you're very cognizant of that. You're very targeted. Well, now you're really dictating the, your market. You're dictating the clientele that is going to hire you. You're dictating the budget they're going to have, right? Mm-hmm. The scope of work. And so now it puts you in a position where the projects that have the budget, right? They have the scope, right? And the aesthetic. And so now it could be really successful when you're thinking end game photography and marketing and that relationship, how, you know, network network. And it's, so, so from your side, Dagan, I mean, when you start thinking about scope of work, I'm sure your companies evolve. Not everyone, when they open their doors, especially as a wine sommelier are building, you know, in Rancho Santa Fe, right. you know, so how's that evolved? I mean, and, and what is your focus now? You mentioned ADUs. I know that's very common there. And for those listening, you know, accessory dwelling units, and these are very common in California, especially where it's mm-hmm. very expensive and it's easy, easier to get a permit because yep. it's less restrictive as a new build. Um, but you can now have a guest casita or a gym or home office or whatever through COVID, right? Right. Yeah, um, that seems to be the new scope of work is a uh, full house remodel and then ADU plus whatever else we're doing. Um, yeah, like I said, it, it, all each government city has sort of created their own permitting for it to make it easier. And half the cities actually pay for your permit now um, if you do wow. an ADU. And why um, is that? Yep. Um, basically, it's low-income housing. It's a way for them to combat low-income housing. Um, you know, we have the not in our backyard sort of policies on the coast. So basically every city can't get any, um, you know, large uh, low income housing project off the ground because they always get shut down by neighbors. Um, So this was basically a way for California to combat that basically through personal building. So each one of those ADUs counts towards California's low income housing stock um, because we've been out of balance for 15 years or something like that. Um, so it's super common cause, uh, and even more so now cause of COVID, uh, you know, most of our areas, they don't use it for low income housing. They just right. use it as an additional space they can use. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the last two I've done, uh, one that we're doing in Fairbanks is just going to be for a gym. Um, they already have two extra guest bedrooms in the house. It's just going to be for a, an awesome gym that looks over the pool. Um, so you know, the purpose of what they're used for are all sort of vary. Some people use it as overflow guests. You know, it's a way to not have to have your guests inside your home. They could have their own space with a kitchen. Um, you know, one, what well, we built the owner, basically a three bedroom house. That was the guest house. Um, he, he kept one of the bedrooms for his office and then the garage ended up being the gym and they still have a two bedroom, two bath house for their guests. Um, so it worked out cool. You know, there's, there's different uses for it. And, um, some people absolutely use them for rentals and offset their, you know, their mortgages. And it's a great way for homeowners to do that. Um, so it's, it's kind of a varied, uh, deal for ADUs right now and what they're used for, but it is a little bit quicker permitting. There's a lot of new regulations on them, but you know, we're just, we're learning them. They change, they've been changing every year now for the last three years. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's smart. It's smart to understand where the market's going and what's driving the market and then be accessible to that, right? That you can perform yep. and do that and that's your scope of work. You know, for most of your clientele, I know you mentioned it is scarce. You know, I, I know Southern California very well. And, you know, if you're on the outskirts, yeah, there's new building. But, you know, inland, you know, I shouldn't say inland, but when you're near the coast, right, that real estate's tight. It's eaten up. Everyone wants to live there. So do you deal with a lot of clients scraping their house, building new? Is it mostly remodel? I know you mentioned they'd use already, but How does that differ from new build construction to remodel? Um, Most, unless they're dead set on scraping it, which they can, the process um, adds usually about a year to a year and a half minimum just on the permitting side. Um, So Coastal Commission sort of it dictates how all these permitting things go. So there's a, a weird clause. If you leave 50% of the existing wall line, it can be considered a remodel. So even if you just leave, you know, 51% of the existing house, you can still, so I've done this a few times where we took a 900 square foot cottage, left 51% of the wall line and built a, you know, 3,400 square foot home. Um, so in reality, there there's a 900 square feet of the foundation footprint and 51% of the existing walls that was original. But basically it was a new house, but it also saved about a year, probably 14 months in permitting and an extra, you know, probably close to 80,000 in permitting costs. Yeah. I was going to say that too, because same here. I mean, if you're remodeled to a new build, the permit cost is different too. So I'm sure that's part of the advantage of, of yeah. doing what you mentioned. 
Yeah, timing is always, I mean, we're in a very, so, you know, if someone says, I, I really want to scrape this house and start new, you know, I'm going to tell you, we're not going to get a permit for two years. So yeah. just, if you're okay with that, like, okay, let's go down that road. But like, there is no acceleration. There's no way of doing this faster. Um, we're not going to hear back from Coastal Commission probably for at least eight months. And then we have probably at least another six to eight months with the city. So just, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's expansive. It's yes. crazy. I mean, it, it, it's really tough to work around that, you know? And so how, how has your business grown? I mean, how are you managing the flow of work? You know, a lot of contractors are busy. So how are you vetting clients to understand that, hey, this is something we want to work with, as well as the scope of work we want to do, and as well as we can fit in our schedule and still perform? Yeah, I mean, it, it's been a, a little bit of trial and error on, on how, what size company I want to get to. Um and and I've I've really enjoyed you know I really only work in about a you know seven mile radius so it's wow. super close awesome. um, so you know when I have three projects I can pretty much get to them every day um, so uh, that's sort of been what I've found to be the sweet spot and it's still sort of a uh, developing to see what we can take and um, you know, this happened to me a couple of years ago. I, you know, I said, I'm, I'm tapped out. I'm not going to take anything for, you know, these projects are going to take me f for 16 months. So I'm just, I'm sort of tapped out right now. And then a great project came along. <laughs> so I just, yeah. I bid it and I, you know, I said, I got to do it. Uh, it was with a great set of designers and, you know, I, I ended up winning it and you just figure it out. I was able to scale up and, um, you know, it, it worked out fine and, and they've been great clients and long-term clients of mine. So uh, you know, I, I try to keep, I'm a little bit more of a boutique. And I, like I said, I, I really only keep to like three cities. I'm, you know, I'm Rancho Santa Fe, Solana Beach, Encinitas. And I occasionally do one as far as, you know, Carlsbad and maybe La Jolla, <laughs> but I really don't go there. <laughs> I'm pretty envious. Our footprint's much bigger than that in Phoenix. It just has to be, but it's it's yeah. nice when you can work in that window. So are you yeah. still performing any work or is it all uh, general contracting? Pretty much all general contracting. I, I get involved on, um, you know, I, my background is really finished carpentry. You know, I, I used to build furniture and, and finished carpentry is sort of what my background is. Um, so occasionally on, on sort of finishing up projects, I get involved and I just do some installs, you know, I'm helping out with the mirror installs and just little things just to make sure that that final punch list gets done right. Um, but I'm pretty much, I'm just general contract at this point. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's, it's good to understand your lane, right? I mean, you understand your scope, you know, it's successful you know, which is going to allow you to be successful for the client. Now, when you look at company culture, I'm not sure how big your company structure is. How does that play a role as far as the communication internally with your team, the culture, things you're doing now to provide a healthy culture? Yeah, I mean, it's super huge. Um, um, I, I've always just wanted to give my guys a lot of freedom to learn and give them the sort of ability to try and, and, and learn from their mistakes. Um, and I, I want to challenge them. I want them to get as involved as they want to be. So if I if I get a good foreman and he's eager to learn, like absolutely, I want to get that guy as involved as possible. I'm going to get him, you know, on the track to be a superintendent type person for me. I want him on on the job, you know, reporting back to me. I want him to know that he has, you know, authority on the project to, you know, you know, talk to subcontractors. So it's really, I, you know, if, as much as I can empower people to make good decisions, but obviously know when to call me and ask for, you know, if something's just not right or this doesn't seem correct or, you know, know when to move ahead because you're, you're confident in that ability and when to call me. Um, so it's just, it's just a learning curve. Um, you know, I've had some good guys and I've had some not so good guys. So you just, the ones that are good, you know, give them every resource possible and every confidence booter possible to, you know, keep them moving and keep them growing and what they want to do. Um, Cause I, I think I, I think I watched the podcast earlier of uh, on you about subcontractors and framers, you know, taking the next, you know, higher bid to the next guy. And I've seen that a lot. So if you get a good guy who's eager and likes your company culture and is, is into working with you, you know, do whatever you can to give that guy the confidence and whatever resources he needs to, to grow within your company. <laughs> yeah. there. It, it's interesting. You know, I've seen where some of my uh, trade partners, you know, they've struggled with where they've lost good people and maybe they took too long to realize that they were that good or they didn't think about the cost to replace. Right. I mean, a lot of us look at, 
over overhead's tricky and because the reality is there is still payroll there is still overhead i mean we have to hit these pay points and it's it, it doesn't rest right we know every week every two weeks that that has to be liquid dollars right even if we're not being paid from our customer or our vendors or we have to advance deposits like our people need to be paid and and you know we've we've internally looked at this a lot especially in the last couple of years uh my controller myself and you know our team is okay certain people okay we they may be paid a little bit higher or they may have this level but you also have to look at what's the cost to replace them right what's the cost to bring someone else in and train them get them up to this level you know what's the cost of that transition we all know turnover whether it be a new truck or phone i mean there's just so much time where's the value and are we putting the value in the people and it's a tough balance though because reality is we still have to cover costs and, and it's a fine balance for any owner to go through that yeah absolutely um i mean i think it even is accurate to say in with subcontractors you know i i have a hard time wanting to change too many subcontractors because once they understand what we're trying to do and we've gone through a couple of these like they automatically know like oh yeah yeah we always set those at here because we're always you know they, they understand those details um and it takes a lot to get a subcontractor up to speed for some of these things um and you know we pretty much just all do pretty high-end custom so not everyone is totally on board on how all that works or what's involved or you know how to bid that correctly so a lot of my guys you know it's like automatic with you know my my drywall or like this is a level five smooth right yep we're on we're on board I, we, we you know what to expect for you know this type of drywall um so it's, it's sort of just an unspoken you know we're on the same page when we get on board so it's not as lengthy of a, a bidding process it's just let's walk through this because we already know the details that are going to go into this because you know, remember that one and that one, we're pretty much doing exactly like that. So, um, with subcontracts, it's super challenging because, um, they all want more money every time. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, you just try to keep up with those, with those. And, uh, you know, I, I've been pretty lucky. Most of the, my subs have always asked, like, can I just, what is your schedule? Cause I'd rather just work for you all this year if possible. So, you know, I, I've, I've been, fortunate and i think i've hopefully created a good environment because they they keep wanting to come back so um you know i, I think i've I, I also listened to a modern podcast with nick and them and I, I listened to one of them and i think he was talking about uh the the trick of of handling your subcontractors where it's it's not a free-for-all whatever you want to get paid because i need this done to the quality i need but it's it's finding that happy balance of i want to pay you absolutely what you're worth and what it takes to get these details right but let's not abuse that a relationship on us you know yeah and and that's a really good point i mean you think about the complexity and, and unfortunately i think most clients and even most people don't understand the complexity of our job as a general contractor right and so not only are you trying to balance you know a thousand different people that play an impact in the completion of the home but you're also managing the risk you're managing liability the safety the legal side right? The warranty, future failures. I mean, they're, it's a serious business, right? That we shouldn't take lightly. And, you know, I remember speaking with Matt Reisinger, he's on the podcast and he, he was very much on this line that, look, Brad, even on a cost plus, like you, you need to push back that where a lot of uh, clients will say, Hey, I want three bids. I want three concrete bids. And we all know there's nothing more expensive than a cheap bid. Right. Yeah. And so you, you have to have good people, especially when it comes to the structure that you don't deviate. You know, some things you could have some more lenience and you could take maybe a low bid or someone that's qualified. Um, but to your point, what's interesting, you know, I look back and, and this is really comforting. We have, um, we're doing a project right now with board form concrete and it's, it's a very technical job and our concrete guy is awesome. I mean, seriously, the best. And he's nailed this board form. In fact, I've had a few architects and other builders come by and they're like, how did you find someone to do it this good, right? It just looks so good. You would never want to get another bid for that. No, <laughs> no and way. I'm like, that's the thing. I'm not getting another bid because, <laughs> no. because th with board form, it's very tricky to have to look. You can't blow out. So, I mean, it's a very complicated install and it you looks really good. You get one shot at it. <laughs> you get one shot and you have to do it right. And he's nailed it in very complicated parts of the home, right? And, and not just that, but I, going back to it, even outside of that, we had an issue with the slab and... um and I think I did a YouTube video on this, but he, he, the client is very adamant. He's a building science client and he's very adamant on the mix and the temperature. And, uh, you know, we were doing slump tests when it came out and everything. And, and bottom line is there was a mesh that he ordered incorrectly. And when we got the ticket, right, the mesh was incorrect. It was supposed to be in the mix. And the client was upset, right? And wanted the slab ripped out. And, and he stood behind. And he said, look, Brad, I'll rip it out. If the client wants me to rip it out and redo it. I will. 
or give him a credit, you know, and, and, and cash credit. And he did, he stood behind the work and, you know, without going down the resolution, it was resolved, clients on off, clients super happy, but he stood behind, there's value there. I think a lot of times Huge. we miss that value. We're maybe looking at buyout or a number or contract at someone instead of looking at the big picture. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a, it's a really fragile relationship you have to sort of keep with your subs. And on the opposite end, I, I've had, you know, especially when it comes to like trim work and painters, you know, there's been a couple of times where I'll notice something that I know the homeowner is going to notice. And, you know, he's already gone. He's about to pack up his tools and it's like, whatever it takes, you know, I'll pay you for your extra few days, whatever, whatever it takes, but we got it. We got to fix this. Cause I already know if I said, you know, we need to fix this, it's already the battle of, well, you know, no, that's, that's good. And, you know, it's one of those things. So I've also just learned that sometimes taking the hit once for them and then showing them how we do it next time, that next time it gets done correct. Um, and you know, it's, it's not huge dollar amounts, but it's one of those things where it's just better not to let the homeowner see it or, you know, that's one less thing that the homeowner might have to punch list for us. So it's just, it's challenging. Um, you know, you probably know all the details, you know, painting on cabinetry, all the trim work, all those little things that like they're minuscule as far as detail work, but there's something that some homeowners just have a real problem with. So you just learn, like you've got to get them right <laughs> over time. Yeah, you do. And there's, I mean, a good painter is everything. If you have a good trim guy, a good painter, I mean, it does, it definitely covers up a lot of, uh, a lot of items there, you know, especially if they're doing a really good job with their prep work. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so from your side, Dagan, I mean, are you, do you have any ventures outside of DDC, right? Dagan Design Construction? Yeah. So, um, it actually sort of was brought on by one of my clients, but, um, it's a bit of a, I, we just did a, a large remodel for the client and, um, they travel a lot and they have, they have a house in New York and, um, they used to have a house, I believe it was in Outer Banks somewhere in North Carolina. And they, they used to, they called it like a private HOA. It was basically like a group or, or someone who came by their home to monitor, sort of like a home management, but it had sort of a, a, a elevated level of service to it. So basically I started this company and, and I also watched, um, I've been sort of listening to a few podcasts and I know uh, Patterson does a really good maintenance mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. So I've run into the same things like he did where I just, I don't want to deal with the, the who, whose fault was it. I just want to maintain it and sort of resolve those problems before they get to be problems. Um, so I've sort of started a maintenance company and um, DDC Next is a company called. So we do basically home management. So for a couple of people that have second homes. Uh, one of my employees goes by there weekly. Um, we have a whole checklist. You know, it's, it's basically like, you know, we monitor the home. Um, some of them keep cars. We we start their cars. And it's also just a great, you know, revenue stream outside of our sort of chaotic world of building. We know, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And um, I remember, uh, you know, because I started my company just about leaving the recession of our, our you know, 08. Wow. And uh, there was a big builder uh, that, you know, gave me, you know, help me and give me a couple proposals to work off of. And I remember he was, he was a big builder. He built lots of great homes on the coast here. And he said, basically, I just take everything that comes my way at this point. And that was right after the recession. And he was just so nervous of whatever was going to happen next. He's like, I'll take anything. You want me to just build a fence tomorrow? Fine. I'll do it. Like <laughs> he, he was on board for anything just because he didn't know what the next deal was going to be. So, um, I sort of, that still is in my head. I I've, I've, got away from it because I, I've been a lot more client selective and I, you know, some of my biggest mistakes were just seeing, not, not responding to red flags, you know, on pre-construction or client selection. So I've just gotten a lot better about knowing when to say no. Um, and I, I listened to Sean Van Dyke's book and one of his big things is you gotta know when to say no. And it's like, yep. it's so true. You just, you, you gotta, you gotta be confident. Um, and I'm not as hungry as, you know, I was in my earlier years and needing to take on everything. So now it's, and I think I'm a better contractor for it. You know, I, I'm, I'm choosing the ones that I think are the best fit for our company culture, what we do. And I think the clients are the best fit for us. So I think everyone wins when I have the confidence to say no. <laughs> yeah. That patient, I mean, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. I think a lot of us builders don't think about that. I mean, if you understand your runway and what you're really, your wheelhouse, what you're really good at and what you're not good at, you know, and you could direct the client, they'll, they'll actually have more admiration. I, you know, there's a client and it was a great job and they entrusted me to do it. And I finally looked at him and said, look, 
this is not good. It's not going to be good. You're going to spend $1.8 million on this. And if I were you or your financial advisor, I'd say, don't do it. And he looked at me and he said, really, you're going to walk away from $1.8 million? And I'm saying, I wouldn't do it. Maybe sell your house, build a new one, we'll remodel a different one. But in this, you're not going to get it back. And he, you know, he's an athlete. He plays for the Cardinals. And he said, and he did. He sold the house. And it was pretty neat because you know, we didn't get the job, which is fine. And it worked out better for him, which it should have. But he even called me later and he said he spoke to his personal financial advisor, you know, and he's like, you have no idea, you know, the reputation which made by willing to walk away. And sometimes it's just better to counsel your clients, even if it means you're going to lose a job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, some of the, the most uh, interesting um, leads that I've gotten uh, that I've, I've personally, I, I always find it really fascinating is it was, you know, it always takes me a while to like remember the job I bid, but it was, it was a job I didn't get. But the job I didn't get, they recommended me to their friend. So I think they went down the road with another contractor, but they were very impressed with whatever I did that they recommended me to their friend and not the contractor they ended up working with. I, I've, I've had a few of those over the years, and it's always fascinating. And so, like, during, uh, you know, these proposals and during these sort of uh, pre walkthroughs and, and interviewing processes, you know, sometimes you do some things right that definitely strike a chord with people. And sometimes obviously you don't get the job, but whatever I'm doing in some way, shape or form has worked to, you know, my advantage somehow, you know, I didn't get a job, but they recommended me do a much better job down the road. So it worked out. You never know who's watching, right? You don't burn bridges. <clears throat> no. You're always looking at, you know, at the, at the big picture there. So what's upcoming and exciting for you, Dagan? We have some great projects. Like I said, we're, we're like a little bit of a boutique. We have some uh, two houses in Rancho Santa Fe right now. Um, one's a, a pretty substantial remodel. It's a big home. It's a, I think it's close to 10,000 square feet, the house. Um, and then uh, another one in Fairbanks Ranch, which is, a, an, again, a pretty large home that we're, we're doing a pretty large remodel and adding about 1,000 square feet over the garage and a, a new guest house in the rear. Um, and then my sort of, project i'm doing it's a it's a new house in um town of encinitas um and it's it's kind of a you know i have a design background so i actually am designing this whole house from scratch <clears throat> um, by myself so i'm doing the architecture um i'll be general generaling it um i'm also going to do all the interiors and selections um wow. so it's a you know it's it's a it's an opportunity for me to put my stamp on what I've learned through, you know, these great designers and architects I've worked with. So it's been really cool to be able to pick and choose those awesome variables that I got from, you know, various people and what was drawn to me and what materials I really, you know, I'm drawn towards. So um, it'll either be something that, you know, my family moves into or um, if the market's nuts like it is and it, it's whatever it is, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. But it's going to be super fun and I'm pretty excited about that. Well, that's some awesome news. We'll, we'll definitely want to follow along there, Dagan. And where can our listeners find you? Um, so website is DaganDesignConstruction.com. And then uh, my Instagram is Dagan Design. And uh, I'm um, stepping up my game a little bit on Instagram. I got a videographer <laughs> hired up. And um, we're hoping to uh, get some really good short videos on the new build in Encinitas. And uh, I'm going to try to, you know, get a little bit detailed on some of the building, you know, methods we're doing and specific materials. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, good for you. you. Must've been talking to Nick at Ennis Builders, you know, get that, get that video. Yeah. Going. That guy's got some drive. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah. Well, Dagan, you've been amazing, man. I really appreciate making time and just sharing a little bit more about your business with us today. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, man. So thank you all for tuning into the podcast today. And just as a recap, if you check the show notes, they're just going to have all the links for the topics that we discuss. And also one of our favorite features now is the chapters that go through the conversation. So if there's certain topics you want to revisit or listen to, they're outlined by the time that we discuss those. And again, we can't thank you enough for all of your support. Please make sure and download our podcast, subscribe, give us a five-star rating and review wherever you download your podcast.